Ignition flight. Roger. Men have been embarking on odyssey since the dawn of civilization. In 1970, Captain James Lovell, commander of the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission, named his command module Odyssey. I decided to look up the definition of Odyssey, and it was indeed a long voyage with many changes of fortune. <laughs> that it was in spades. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main main bus thunderbolt. You see an AC bus thunderbolt there, guys? The granddaddy of all odysseys comes to us from a thousand years before Christ. Translated to film in this old Kirk Douglas movie, it is the story of a mythical Greek warrior named Odysseus and his search for home. Together with its companion poem, the Iliad, they form Western literature's first action-adventure story, written by the man we call Homer. It is a grand adventure, an allegory of all our lives, writ large. first meet Odysseus in the Iliad during one of the most famous wars in history, the Trojan War. We think the actual war happened, if it happened at all, around 1200 BC. It is in the Iliad that we read of Helen of Troy, the face that launched a thousand ships, and in the Odyssey, the Trojan horse, which taught us to beware of Greeks bearing gifts or gifts bearing Greeks. The warriors of the Iliad have left a legacy from the sublime to the ridiculous. Achilles can be found in medical books. Ajax is on every supermarket shelf. Names and images that have survived 3,000 years. These are the first stories we have in the West. And that means that if they're to last, and they have lasted for so long, they must be about virtually everything. Every time you pick up one of those stories, you're on the edge of talking about something archetypal, something that's always with us, something that's wonderfully generalized. The Iliad focuses on the archetype of one sort of hero, Achilles. Powerful, straightforward, and terrifying, the professional soldier. It tells of Achilles' great hubris, or pride, his destructive rage when that pride is injured, and finally his death at the hands of Paris. The most complex hero of the Iliad goes on to star in the Odyssey. Odysseus, whom the Romans called Ulysses, was a different kind of hero. Odysseus was a draftee, brave, bold, a liar, and very, very human. You may remember that James Joyce wrote his great work, Ulysses, based on Homer, and when he was asked why he did it, he said it was because uh, Ulysses was the only complete man in literature. He said that uh, the other great figures in literature are not complete. Hamlet was not a complete man, uh, nor any of the other figures who, who play a leading role in literature. But in Ulysses, we see the person who was uh, canny, uh, courageous, devious, uh, full of love and hate and uh, ready to, to face all challenges. The descendants of Odysseus are legion. We meet them today in action-adventure heroes like Indiana Jones. Odysseus has fought long and hard at Troy on behalf of his ally, King Agamemnon. When that brutal war is over, Odysseus is eager to return to his beloved wife, Penelope and to reassert himself as the head of the kingdom of Ithaca. The Odyssey is about that return trip. 
It is also an extended lesson in decorum. The main moral code governing human action in the Odyssey, it is this code of the protection of the stranger, of, of hospitality, of looking after people who turn up in your country. And it's a system too, it's a system in which you don't do it just out of pure good-heartedness. Someday you may be in his country and you expect that he will return all the gifts you've given him. The same basic rules of hospitality persist today, but mostly as the polite conventions of, say, a dinner party. The guest gets fed. In return, he entertains the host. But back when civilization was just beginning to take hold, an offer of a meal could mean the difference between survival and death. If you are going to travel around on an odyssey, there are no motels you can stop at, and there is the bargain of the give and take of hospitality. So there is the practical aspect of it. And then there is the moral aspect of it, which appears not only in Greek literature, but in practically every religious um, literature uh, in the world, of the idea that you must um, be uh, hospitable to people, you must take people in, you must share what you have. And it's made very explicit in the Odyssey. The return trip can be looked at as a series of tests, each one of which Odysseus has to pass to reach home. Odysseus' adventures, if we see them as tests, are much larger versions of the kinds of crises and problems and issues and adventures to which each of us is subject over the course of, of life. And we see him as someone confronted with problems which are really so much more intense than the ones you and I would ever experience. The voyage from Troy back to Ithaca should have taken Odysseus about two weeks. Instead, it took 10 years. What became a very bad trip started with a host's poor manners and a hero's mistake, a big mistake. After all, Odysseus was an epic hero. He and his crew came ashore on the island of the Cyclops in search of food and find themselves unwanted guests in the cave of a Cyclops named Polyphemus. The wary Odysseus introduces himself using an alias, No Man. This witty AKA protects Odysseus, though not all of his men. Instead of having dinner served as they expected, some of them are served as the main course. The Odyssey not only contains the basic rule, which is watch out whom you turn from your door, but it is full of marvelous examples of good and bad hosts and good and bad guests. Uh, you have the ultimate in bad hosts, who is Polyphemus, who says, why should I bother? I don't feel obligated, which is what a lot of people say to, today. And so he takes his guests and batters their brains uh, on the floor and eats them. This is a big no-no in the etiquette rules of hospitality. Do not repeat, not eat your guests. Rules are rules. The giant, having been such a dreadful host, pays dearly for his rude behavior. His payback? A poke in the eye with a sharp stick. Odysseus has triumphed. The Greeks liked this story for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, it pitted a wily, clever Greek against a monster who was bigger and stronger, and yet the Greek wins out over him because he's so intelligent. When initially Polyphemus, having been blinded and running out of his cave in rage and in anger, and in trying to get the guy who did him in, who has told him up to this point, my name is no man, and it's a play but Polyphemus doesn't get it, he's too dumb. But Odysseus wouldn't be Odysseus if he chose to be remembered as no man. And in fact, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about him if that's all he had said. It's when he believes he's out of Polyphemus' reach that he yells back, the one who has blinded you, I am Odysseus, sacker of cities. Son of Laertes and king of Ithaca! 
giant's father, Poseidon, is all-powerful in the realm of the sea. Polyphemus can't retaliate, but Dad can and does. Poseidon consigns Odysseus to wander the sea and will send him through many a dangerous test. And so all of Odysseus' travails at Poseidon's hands, presumably, are a consequence of that need to say who I am. And I, I remind you in Greek, is ego, his ego, himself. And that is Odysseus. He is self, he is ego, he's the individual. This individual is going to have a long journey home. A Greek historian of the second century BC mapped what he thought was the Odyssey's itinerary. It was a route that took Odysseus to 12 different destinations, including Egypt, Africa, and Sicily, and across thousands of nautical miles. Along the way, he would lose each of his ships and all of his men. Some ego trip. Myth is not mere fiction. Its origins lie in the efforts of early peoples to explain the world about them. Myth can be thought of as a form of history, or even an early stab at science. To the ancient Greeks, the supernatural deities who lived on Mount Olympus represented two things, the forces of nature, like water, wind, and air, and the nature of man, his desire, ambition, anger, and jealousy. And the gods not only reflected the world, they also shaped its destiny. The siege of Troy, which left Odysseus to embark on his monumental journey, is the direct result of squabbling among the gods. Not only do the gods set things in motion, but throughout the story, they are never far from the action. In this all-star struggle, Athena, the goddess of wisdom and champion of Odysseus, could represent reason and civilization, while Poseidon represents raw emotion and the forces of nature. <laughs> 